Okay, call this uh, board meeting to order this time. I'm looking around, I see all the board members present, so obviously we do have a quorum. Everyone is here. Uh, at this time, I'll recognize guests, and we have one signed in. Pat Breslin is signed in to speak to the board, uh, give some comments. So, uh, Pat, sure. Time. Turn it over here. That'll be yes, fine. Please. You've got your cameras going here. Yes. <laughs> Hi. I can see you on the camera, so you're good. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, um, and also thank you um, for the opportunity to send an email to you in advance. So you're all aware of what I intend to say. I'm not going to go beyond that. I've, I've been riding my bicycle around. The, the, the concrete pavements for the trails are a great improvement, um, but... Um, a lot of people riding golf carts don't want to move to the side. Um, I'm sure you're all sick and tired of hearing about golf cart drivers who are rude. Most are not, clearly. But um, I was um, I had one incident in particular where the golf cart driver responded to me with uh, uh, cursing, even though he had children on, on the golf cart. And that really upset me. Um, and I was disappointed when I saw the rules, that the rules are not um, specific about what yield means. When a golf cart should yield to a bicyclist, um, I'm sure, I, quite frankly, I'm very sure there are many well-meaning golf cart drivers who think that hewing to the edge of the, the path is good enough. And perhaps in your judgment, you may agree. Um, I don't think it's enough. I think if you're left with a three and a half foot wide space uh, with a bicycle and with not being, you know, an excellent bicyclist, that's just not enough room. Um, and um, I, would, would, I would like the, the rules to be amended to say very clearly what should happen. Um, I acknowledge that there are, there are occasions when um, you're forced to deal with a tight space, but the golf cart should stop, I think, in those cases. Um, I, th I just don't think the word yield, standing by itself, says the message enough. My other um, request is to consider, once again, finding some way to put an identification number on the back. Because whether it's a bicycle incident or a pedestrian inc incident, or perhaps a driver is underage, or whatever the issue is, typically the golf cart is driving away. And I've given a lot of thought to this. I know it won't be easy. The, the configurations on the back of different golf carts are different. Um, and it's going to require some hardware. I mean, it's not, I, I, I acknowledge the difficulty, but I think we're at a point now where we ought to just bite the bullet and say, well, if people need to drill holes in their golf carts or whatever to make it work, it's important to make it work. Otherwise, we're just stuck being upset by somebody who's gone by and you can't do anything except I bought a camera that I attached to the front of my bicycle. And if you clicked on the link in my email, you'll see my video of, of four offenders. But quite frankly, I'm not sure I want to talk to the four offenders unless I can say clearly, you should go off the path, take your right wheels off the path, unless the rules say that. So I'd, I'd like you to consider those, please. Okay. I appreciate, we appreciate your comments to the board as, as we consider uh, the, these issues, both at the board level and the security committee. And also your email that you sent ahead of time uh, gave us a context and a little <clears throat> bit of understanding before we heard you speak. So thank you for both of those. Great. Thank you. We have a consent agenda that has been sent out to all the board members uh, <coughs> this time, looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda. The motion, a second? Second, second. Okay. All in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda as written, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we'll move forward with the consent agenda. We have uh, reports today, uh, starting with Comcast, and I believe Wesley, is that correct? Is well, we're gonna start with JT. JT, JT I'm JT's sorry, gonna JT. Make some introductions. JT? Are you ready? Yes, we're yes. ready. Are we good right here? You want to uh, go over towards that area would be better. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you all for the for the time today. So it's uh, obviously myself, John Todd, um, John Todd and Stopolis, Mr. Kenny Hargis, and we, we actually have Tim Ragdow. He's a director of Xfinity Communities. He's out of Atlanta. And we're really here today just for some updates. You know, we were here, I guess, a few months back and talked about some of the things we're doing to enhance the service here throughout the community. So we wanted to just update you guys, you know, uh, as simple as that. Uh, the first thing is we talked about having a, VI, a VIP tech out here uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday. And we now have that in place. This is this gentleman right here, Mr. Kenny. He is one of the best we have, honestly, in, in, in the Savannah market. And he's out here uh, daily. Been doing it now for what? Uh, since the middle of April. And just knocking out stuff daily, as you all know, stuff comes up, storms and, and this and that. So he's been, he's been on it and it, it's been tremendous. I think everyone's been happy, the, the residents have been happy with his work and just the efficiency and, and how quick we're getting to you know, restore service. So that's the main thing. The second thing is um, Tim's going to talk about the fiber coming into the, onto the island. Uh, we talked about that last time. He's going to provide some updates for us. Tim? Someone muted me. <laughs> thank you. Whoever unmuted me. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Rabdow in, in Atlanta. Uh, very uh, um, appreciative of you inviting me to your uh, HOA meeting. And I live in a neighborhood that has these meetings on a regular basis. And uh, my wife is one of the board members. And I know that uh, she puts a lot of time and effort into it. And I, I have an appreciation for anyone who does that because I usually am not paid uh, a, a ton of money to do it, if any. So, so I, uh, I, my condolences to all the, all the folks who are trying to make the landings uh, the great neighborhood that it. <clears throat> uh, the redundant connection that uh, JT mentioned that is in place now, and I and I maybe lean in a little bit on Kenny because I know we not too long ago had an outage that in the past would have been. Uh, much more impactful to the community, uh, but it's it's not a what I call it, it's a redundant fiber feed into the community. But I don't want to call it a redundant connection because by nature of a redundant connection means when a fiber is cut, it will uh, immediately uh, jump onto the other fiber and, and provide a seamless uh, transition. You might have a small service interruption, but it is what true redundancy is. Uh, Due to the way that the, uh, our plant comes into the community, it, we could not necessarily get a, a, a true redundant connection. So what we have is another fiber feed that allows us at the head end to uh, cut over as soon as we uh, uh, get notified of a disturbance. Uh, we do. We are, we are aware. We have nodes that that, uh, that you know want to go off and basically let us know that there has been a fiber cut and. That, that happened not too long ago, and I know in the past when that has happened without that fiber, that additional fiber feed into the community, you had disruptions that were hours and in some cases even uh, a few days. Well, this one I think was resolved uh, within hours. So I think uh, if, you, if you're aware of it, Kenny, I, maybe you can give some backstory. Maybe you, you weren't aware of the severity of it because it was it was it was uh, repaired pretty quickly. Um, Kenny, I don't know if I'm, I mean, you're much more technical than me, but I know that that was one of the benefits that we did see is that we were able to resolve that issue uh, considerably faster than we did in the past. Yeah, actually, I wasn't aware of it. <laughs> so um, the, what, he, what he's alluding to is just, uh, it's a manual process, but instead of it taking hours to get it restored, it takes a matter of minutes. Uh, so it's just a matter of having somebody on site verifying the fiber's cut, somebody at the head end verifying you know, we still have signal there and then switching it over to the failover. Um, whereas before it was like 12 hours or depending on how long it took to get the crew out to find where it was broken and fix it. So it's a much faster process of getting it resolved. Go ahead, go ahead. Bob. Hey, quick question. So just so I understand the terminology, Kenny, when you say, and you and I have met by the way out in front of my house, so, yes, and I appreciate what you're doing. Um, do you say fiber cut? Is the redundant fiber above ground or underground? It is above ground uh, as far as where it comes to get onto the island and then it goes underground. Underground when it hits the, the island. island. Yes, so both of them are above ground coming over. Right. 
Do they run a similar route? Um, I don't have that information because construction built that. What I was told is they run separate routes up into a certain point and then they come across the same route. Same yeah, route. and that's what we looked at before because um, I believe the last cut was at the Forest City Gun Club area. Yeah, where the trees were. <laughs> right, and so, right. And so, yeah, they, but they showed on a map kind of them coming a different area and then swinging back when you get back out here. Yeah, so, so when a large windstorm and I won't say the H word right now, but can we expect that redundant fiber to pick up where we'll, lo we'll lose, we'll truly lose Comcast and Wi-Fi in a hurricane here? Would the redundant fiber pick that up and restore it quickly, or is that also going to be susceptible to the storm? Depending on the amount of damage done. I mean, there's there's no way without you know crystal ball to be able to tell you for sure. But uh, depending on the amount of damage done, it should allow for at least an additional option of being connected. Okay. Um, if the storm is catastrophic, then well, obviously there's no. It is what yeah. it is. Yeah. But I, I don't recall outages with Matthew or Irma or Hermine or the other ones. For good or all. Yeah, if, if at all, we have power outages, but. We have a generator that runs here, and I don't recall us being down on the internet at the time. So I think I think it was, and that was before the backup. So okay. this worked out pretty well. Okay. Well, I'm still waiting here for for Matthew. So that's good to know. Right. I mean, I think the second redundant line is outstanding because mm -hmm. twelve hours is a long time. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's true. It's really a redundant feed into the community as opposed to I don't like to use the word redundant fiber. Uh, just because I don't know what that means in different situations. We just have uh, some, some complexities to not connect all the, the ability to uh, to actually make it a true redundant ring, if you will, which is, means that you know, the, the, the signals would just go in the other direction uh, and you would never see a loss. Uh, and we do that in most cases, but because of the way that it's coming into the community, there are some links that make it challenging. Uh, it does radically improve our ability to uh, restore services when there is a cut though, just because the likelihood of both is not likely. Uh, but you know, when you use a local hurricane, uh, it can be it can be a pretty uh, severe uh, condition that that could actually end up impacting both of them. But let's hope not. Thank you. Do you uh, that? By the way, I love the, the idea and the service the service model and glad it's fully implemented and, and executing. Do you have any examples kind of of either some statistics of kind of shortening times or maybe some example stories? Uh, yeah, actually uh, one of the things we're tracking is, is the average time to response. Uh, so far, on average, it's taking about three quarters of a day um, for all of the requests that's coming in. So less than a day response time for any requests that's coming in through the website uh, that you have provided to the customers. Um, the biggest issue for most of the customers is that they're not aware of the website link. So once they find out about it and they fill the form out, they're astounded at the response time. They, they love it. So um, there's been a couple of couple of issues where last minute, uh, you know, got, JT got a phone call. Hey, um, you know, I'm working from home. The landscapers cut my line. Can we get somebody out? And I'm out there before the afternoon. They're back up and going again within a matter of hours. So they love it. Yeah, it, we we keep pushing the form. But, you know, people don't necessarily read something until they need it. But if they contact us, then Lynn's on with JT to yes. kind of start, even if they have to fill out the form to get the process rolling. So we handle it on the back end if we need to as well. So what was that response time before? You know. Probably a, a couple of days, a half, two days, three days, depending on. It was it was me going, having to go through the process to get a, to get a technician. Where now I, I can go right there. It's just a lot easier. You know, it's it's a great plan in place. It's working well. Uh, to answer your question, we had some storms out here what, in the last couple of weeks with lightning strikes, and we had I think a whole street that went down, and he basically had them restored within a day, day and a half, which is you know tremendous. I mean, it's you know. Or before it probably would have been perhaps you know two three four days, yeah. um, so th that's that's what we're doing and, and the link is great and it comes directly to me. I get it to him. You know, usually I'll call the custom call the resident right. just to get an idea of exactly what's going on. I get it to him. He gets you know, he and he's basically out here daily 
from 7.30 to 4.30. Mm -hmm. there, there may be some days where he's in training where he's not here for the full day, but that's, you know, few and far between. Right. For the most part, it's, it's, uh, it's quick. I just got two calls from, and people, my number <laughs> is all over the community. <laughs> I just got two calls just in the past half hour. Uh, one is a landscaper cut, they cut the cable. Another one is a lightning strike from this morning. So we're going to try to get them resolved tomorrow or Thursday. Right. And Lynn and I see those come through as well, and I would say, so it's not that the volume's gone down, but the complaint volume, I would think, has gone down about yeah. it in the response of time. I, we've definitely seen a quicker response time with the dedicated tech out here. And, and Kenny's also proactively, you know, when, when there is some downtime for him, he can go kind of check on exposed cables that are kind of, you know, sitting there for too long. He'll, he'll make sure those are being, you know, uh, situated. And he's doing some some maintenance stuff just here and there where you know right. you know so it's 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 the whole thing is it's great it's a great plan and it's working you know as we promised and you know we're gonna keep it going and keep the customers happy. That'd be great. Um, the only thing I could think of here is it might be good if you've got data to share that on some of that that you may be comfortable with. That could be good. One for the PR us. on both sides. Yeah, yeah sure. twofold, right? One to track and then two to publicize sure. in the right way. Yeah, to follow up on and that. And calling 1 800 Comcast isn't the only way to do it. Right. Yeah. Because that's a that's a great story. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're, we can circle back with some, and we actually were just talking about that. And he has that, I have that, so we'll put something together for you guys. I can get it to the car roll yep. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Is that, is that Tim Cope that said that? Is that the suggestion? Uh, Tony Martin, a board director. Tony Martin. Oh, Tony. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I love that idea, and actually, one of the things that I think would be also great to share with the board would be the when when we actually have to cut over to that redundant connection, just because in the past, days in most cases to get it fixed, uh, because we'd have to rely on other utility companies and things like that for us to while that's being repaired be able to restore it immediately with the other fiber. Uh, for most residents, they think that nothing really ever happened, but uh, but that's the good news, right, that we love, love to share and say, hey, uh, last month we had to cut it over once or twice and use that redundant uh, fiber coming to the community. I think that's that's definitely worth noting. And it was not a small investment for Comcast, but it's, it was a necessary investment. Um, the land is a very, very important account to us, and we want to make sure that the residents are pleased with Comcast. Unless you guys have any more questions, I think that's it. I mean, we certainly appreciate the time, and we're going to keep working at it, and like I said, keeping these residents happy. Okay. Any, right. other, any other questions from board members? No? Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tim, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Tom today. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Right. Bob Egan with Capital Emergency Services. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. May again was a very quiet month, which is good. You saw there were two air conditioning units that caught on fire and was no significant damage. Overall, on the fire side, it was calm, which is what we love. Um, on the response time, it was up a little bit from normal. It usually runs in the 80 or so, but uh, it was up a little bit in uh, May, but nothing significant. So overall, I think, you know, from Chatham Emergency Services, uh, we had a very good month. Um, I'd like to give you the, which I hope is the final update. <laughs> <laughs> on our, I call it a love affair. Um, it will four, be 14,000 checks mailed out next month. These are the people that had paid their fire subscription. That was like you, Gary, because you got a, if you received the proxy vote, we still had an obligation to update you and everything. So there'll be 14,000 checks mailed out next month to those people that paid up to like December of last year. So those are refunds, and the refunds will be about 1.1 million will be sent out. Uh, the county, they were gonna phase the, the bills, but apparently now they're gonna send them all out in uh, July. So in July, you should receive a uh, bill from the county for fire protection. Um, 
that if you did receive that proxy vote, uh, let me just say what uh, it really dealt with. We, ha we made three changes to our bylaws. The first change we made was we put our fiscal year in sync with the county. We, we were September 1. We now the county is uh, July 1 to June 30th. So that's just a change in our fiscal uh, year. <coughs> Um, the other thing that we did was we added three directors. They have identified three people who we have met uh, who now will be members of the board for a three-year term. We had 10 board members. We now have 13. One of them is a county commissioner. Uh, another one is a, a lady who owns a, uh, her own business. And then another one is a retired fireman. So that's uh, the addition. And then finally, uh, actually in the past, you were subscribers. We called you subscribers to the fire department. So since that is no longer required, that will go away. So we will have our, our annual and final meeting uh, tomorrow, uh, which is... Uh, Held every year, we have an annual meeting which reports, and if anyone would like to attend, it's out in Garden City at 6.30. Uh, on the proxy side, we received back about 2,200 in favor and about 150 uh, voting against the proposed changes. So overall, I, I think, as I said last month, uh, things are going along well. We give them, we give the county a bill of about a million, a million and a half each month, and, uh, and and that's about what, what we projected, 12 million in that neighborhood to run the fire department. So that has worked out well, and uh, hopefully I'll just report on activities next month. <laughs> so do you have any other questions? Gary had a question, and I hope I Yeah, asked I, I saw Bob at the deck, and I said, I got this proxy thing, but my neighbors didn't. And there was one thing in there about adding the three members, and I didn't know if it was three of already three, which would create a, a log jam since they're county people. And he said, no, no, we have enough, you know, uh, whatever. But I went back and I asked my neighbors a couple of days later whether they got their proxy vote. So apparently it didn't get sent to everybody. No, in, in fact, your question led me the next day to ask that oh, question okay. <laughs> because the only people that got proxy votes were people who will receive a reap a re no, I not so it, right? I, got one. Well, I mean <laughs> remember that that refund is because you might have been billed in July of last year and then in December we stopped all billing. So anybody that pays July through like December oh, okay. still waiting on that. You know, because you you're, you're going to get that refund back because uh, if you paid the whole year, you'll get the whole amount. So that's, that's why there were no proxy votes. Because none of you told me yeah. some person. I said, no, my neighbors, including yeah. one whose son is the fire chief here. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> but anyway, so thanks to Gary, okay. I got the answer to that okay. question. Because <laughs> I didn't know. Anyway, uh, Any other that's questions? all I have to report. No other questions? Okay, thanks, Bob. Thank you. All right. Um, staff reports and action items. I just have a couple items to uh, report on before we go into the financial report. One is uh, we continue to be full speed ahead on the new app with Alessant, uh, the, the company. They've been great to work with. We are now having weekly meetings with members of each department, uh, working with uh, the developer and our main contact over there. Lynn has been pulling together all of the content for it. We're trying to get our brains around, okay, this isn't a website, it's an app, so what do we put on there and how does it look? So we have our next meeting tomorrow um, morning. Hopefully it will have us a little something to look at. They're starting to work with us on that. So that's coming along and we're excited to start moving it forward. And, and as I said, we're having weekly meetings, so we're not gonna lose the momentum on that. The other one was we're starting to meet with the different departments on our budget work. Uh, people are finalizing that. We're meeting internal, and we're going to start setting up budget liaison meetings with the finance committee uh, starting in, I believe, two weeks from now. 
So everything is full speed ahead on, uh, on that as well. Um, the online payment portal is going well, but I know Jessica is going to cover that in her uh, finance uh, review. And I'll open it up, see if anybody has any questions of overall items. Nope. Jessica. The financial information starts on page 11 in your packet. This is for the um, numbers at the end of May of 2022. Total cash at the end of May equaled 11.541 million and investments equal 3.474. We are currently working with the investment subcommittee and also um, a firm that we invest with. We're seeing the fastest rate fastest growing rate environment since 1968. And we are going to be soon um, investing another million out of our capital reserves fund to hopefully hopefully gain some, some interest earnings uh, that otherwise we wouldn't be seeing in our money market account. Total operating revenue at the end of May equals uh, 4.529 million compared to the budget of 4.290. That's 238,000 more than budget and more than where we were at the end of May of, of 2021. Total operating expense before depreciation equal 4.033 million compared to our budget of 4.292, which is 258,000 less than budget, slightly higher than where we were at the end of May of 2021. Net operating revenue over expense after depreciation equals 169,000, which is 497,000, better than what our budget projected. A few of those reasons, we still see strong architectural fee revenue, fuel and merchandise sales are definitely performing strong, uh, even with the price per gallon of uh, gasoline and diesel right now. Um, other revenue is mainly due to Comcast. That was a timing difference between when we received our revenue versus where we had placed that in the budget. Staffing expenses are performing better than our budget, mainly due to vacancies. And then the one full-time position that we had planned that we, we continue to not fill for this, the remainder of this year. Um, slightly higher than where we were at the end of 2021 due to the uh, 401k forfeiture funds that we used to uh, fund the employer side of the 401k expense. Median refurbishments performing better than budget, mainly due to the timing of projects and our bad debt expense is performing better than budget and better than last year, mainly due to less um, assessment accounts that we have that currently owe for 2022. Capital reserve expenditures, we've currently spent 1.9 million out of our $4.8 million budget can see on the graph which of those categories and the percentage represents the total spend versus the um, budget to date. Um, you will also see on page 25 and 26 in your packet an updated status on all of the projects that we planned to um, complete in 23. As we're starting our budget process, we took a look at what we, what we planned um, originally and what we evaluated that has useful life that can continue longer than 2023 and we placed a note next to each of those columns that they can be moved into a future year. Members equity at the end of May equals 13.992 million which is 1.6 million better than uh, or more than where we started at the, at the beginning of, of the year. Accounts receivable aging we have 32 accounts as of today in our non-assessment category that have a past due balance of 90 days and we are currently at 17 accounts that still have a balance for our 2022 assessment. Three of those are either in probate or we have notification that they are in the closing process. So that number, number will continue to um, go down. The online customer payment portal, we placed this into service for the uh, community on June 8th. We sent an email for, um, to the community letting them know that they would soon receive an email from PayFabric 
and that um, they can either register for the portal if they so choose to. It's only voluntary, it's not a requirement, but this will gain access to be able to see payment transactions and detail for all of the non-assessment charges that hit the customer's account. These are typically charges from the marinas, uh, mailbox fees, any fines that are incurred, um, hopefully none, but any fines that are incurred on, on those customer accounts. Currently, we have 580 registered users and 24 of those have elected to uh, respond and, and enroll in our auto pay. We had some questions as we went along the way, is this spam, um, can this be integrated with our club account? Um, we have continued to include the message in weekly e-news articles also, so hopefully that if, if people read that, they'll, they can ask or they'll see that yes, this is, this is not spam, it is real. Um, and you can either log in to see all of your transactions and take take full um, advantage of the whole portal or you don't have to use it. Um, you will still receive email notifications each time a charge posts to the customer account. Um, it comes with a PDF and you can see the invoice. It'll show you the date that it was generated. It'll show you the gallons of gas that you purchased, how much that gas was, if you really want to look at that, um, or any other details that uh, belong on the um, on the charge, ice cream, drinks, lemonade, tea, it's, it's very detailed. Um, you don't have to use it to the full capacity if you don't want. If you don't want to, you can check out and pay your account as a guest, or you can just delete the emails if you want to continue to pay your Marina account through our automatic ACH draft that we've been doing for your account, or if you want to send us a check. Any of those options are still available. This is just another, another um, tool to add to your toolbox. So any questions on the financial report or the customer payment portal? Questions? Okay. Uh, on, the, on the PDF for the marina bill, is there a section on the PDF, you know, the, the old school bill that right. now <laughs> says, yes. do you want to pay with yes. credit card? Yeah. Hey, fabric? Yes, we did just add that this month. Um, it will be on the next bill that you see, Perfect. and it'll say now available to pay your non-assessment bill online, and it'll have the link there. Yeah, I will warn you that that message will be on all of our statements. Um, we can't just, <laughs> we can't differentiate between assessment and non-assessment that that messaging will be on. So we did add the words you can pay your non-assessment charges on mm -hmm. this portal. So we'll, we'll see how that works, but um, it's so far, um, it's, it's been pretty seamless. We did have a day of downtime when we did a software upgrade, but um, everything came back up and we worked it out. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Jessica. Aaron. <laughs> I'm here to share with you the uh, community development report for May of 2022. Um, to start off with, we can talk about the number of permits issued from the community development department. We had an increase from this year to from last year. We're at 101 permits as of May um, 31, and we were at 90 the same time last year, so we do see an increase in that activity. We also see a pretty large increase in the amount of applications reviewed by ARC. We're actually reviewing almost double what we were at this time last year. In a summary of the construction activity, we actually did not have any homes completed in the month of May, so we're at nine for the year. Uh, we have two new homes break ground, so we're at 34 active construction sites right now. Um, six major improvements, 49 minor improvements, 21 dumpsters, pods, and porta johns, and then, of course, our permit extension requests are at 21. Um, so when we're looking at the trends, I wanted to start looking at this um, in more than just what we've seen over the last month, but also what we've seen kind of over the last six months, the beginning of this year so far. Um, and what we've seen is that there is a steady increase in the number of applications going before the ARC. And what it's indicating by the type of applications that are going for forward is that these are more sophisticated or complex requests. A lot of times requesting for variances or under construction revisions, so changes being made in the field due to um, shortages of supplies and those kinds of things. Um, so it's, it's definitely taking more time and attention from the 
ARC numbers. Um, our new construction starts have exceeded that which we had um, projected. So we're at 12 new starts um, at the end of May, which is, a, is two more than what we had been expecting. We were projecting we were probably going to get two per month. Um, we actually have seen, seen that number rise in June, too. So there's going to be some pretty interesting stats for next month. Um, major improvements over the last month were more for building additions or major revisions to those buildings rather than outdoor living features, which we've been seeing um, recently. And then our permit extension requests are actually starting to decline. So we're hoping that that is an easing in the supply chain um, and that word that the contractors and the builders are actually building that into their time frame and understanding that there is a, there is a delay on these types of things. When we talk about our PPMS activity, our violations have actually increased significantly. Um, some of that is just due to um, this time of year. There's a lot of landscaping violations and things that come forth. We've also been following up on a lot of those courtesy notices and they are turning into violations. So we are seeing a spike. You sometimes see these, these trends go up and then they'll die off a little bit as um, we get more rain bonds fill in, things sometimes tend to remedy themselves, but we have seen a pretty big uptick in the month of May. Um, with courtesy notices, we also had a rise in those as well. Um, over this time last year, it was kind of on par. Um, so we're still moving forward with those and reaching out and providing information, especially to those new owners who, who may need a little more assistance or um, you know, information to help, help get things in order. Uh, with the summary of inspection activity, we had 175 site visits and ARC inspections, and those include things like follow-up inspections on um, when dumpsters or pods are removed, or if it has to do with the uh, new construction sites, it's one of the scheduled inspections for those. We had uh, just over 1,400 proactive PPMS um, inspections, follow-up inspections, and those were in phase one to admit midpoint. Those phases also have some relation to the number of violations. We tend to find that there are certain areas of the community where they're undergoing more landscaping challenges due to the shade and shadow or the types of vegetation that are naturally in, prominent in those areas. So that's also an indicator. And of those violations um, that we have open, 35 were resolved. So are there any questions over the monthly activity for May? Any questions for Aaron? No. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Tim, monthly security report. Okay, Mark. Well, yes. Getting set. Can I just say something since I do sit in on sure. this? And I've said this, I want to keep saying it. If people have never observed how ARC works, Zoom in or whatever it is, teams in to see it. Um, they'll stay till one o'clock. Start at nine. Um, both Aaron and Morgan have incredible knowledge with all the diagrams that are put up. They and they and the people who are on the committee have studied them. I've actually gone and driven around and looked at some of the properties that, not <coughs> just the problem ones to see when they have a problem. I just want to see what's happened or is it as bad as they might see. But this is a very dedicated group of hardworking people and it's not an hour meeting, it's three to four hours twice a month. Uh, and I'm just really impressed with how well you guys run the meeting. And then I think I mentioned in the workshop that there are um, as we update our like, rules and regulations, there are things I'm sure that they can bring to us to talk about it. Sure. Tim, are you sharing that? You can see it. You can see it, yes. okay. Okay, can everybody see that? Kim, you good? Got it. All right, um, so overview of the uh, statistics for the security department, the month of May. Uh, you'll see all of our crimes and whatnot are uh, trending down. Uh, it's been consistent throughout the year. Uh, again, recap for May, uh, part one crimes down from four to two. 
the birds and thefts down from eight to two. Uh, vandalism is one to zero, and trespass zero to zero. Part one crimes, and if you notice on page 25, we have this <coughs> robbery X actually listed as a burglary. We'll get with CCDD on that. Um, you know, the difference between a burglary and a robbery is the uh, amount of force used. And there was no force used or implied in this particular one. Uh, so uh, three individuals did go into a home on Low Country Lane, demanded that uh, they give uh, the resident give them money. Uh, he went to the safe and got money and jewelry and uh, the passport, actually. So that did occur. Um, Chatham County Police Department is working the case. And uh, just last week, I uh, met with the detective. So uh, she's on top of it. She's um, making progress. Um, the aggravated assault was at a residence on Deer Run. Um, that was between a resident and a resident, a strange husband, uh, and another person in, in his home. So. Crime statistics year to date, again, kind of trending down from um, 12 to 6 for part one crimes. Birds and thefts, 22 to 6. Vandalism, 17 to 2. Trespass, however, was up from 1 to 4. Golf cart statistics, I think we turned the corner on there. We've been trailing for the year on this. Uh, the number of complaints is down 14%, you know, again, seven to six. So <laughs> one, one less complaint, uh, big deal. Number of citations issued again, 21 to 22. Um, and it, but, you know, we've issued 207% increase in the, in the amount of fines issued. And again, that's because of the, the increase that you guys approved last year. Unlicensed driver, we're still pursuing them. Last month we had three. Unregistered golf cart was one. Traffic related was five. And parking related was two. Hate to bring this up, but you'll be, I'll be harping on this every month until October and November, uh, you know, and typically October. Um, September is our, our busiest month, so they say, but it's been my, uh, my you know, experience that October is really when we start to let our guard down and I'll pass it and then all of a sudden we get hit. Um, but please have a plan, as, as we said, and uh, Seba came and did a great uh, presentation. If you guys didn't happen to um, observe that, I think we got it online, right? Um, so uh, in the pipeline for us, um, <clears throat> if you are part of the RV yard, uh, you should have got an email. We have digital Bluetooth locks out there. So when people no longer have to go to the gates to get the key, go lock, unlock it, and then come back and return the uh, key. So we're going through the process of getting everybody their digital Bluetooth key to go and open those gates. And it's hit and miss. Some people can really read directions as well or are technically <laughs> savvy. Uh, other people, not so much. So... Um, and here in the next month, we ho hope to transition over to the caller authorization. Um, what that means is when you call that 598-1982 number and you press option one to pre-authorize your guest and vendors, you will get an automated attendant that will say, please state your guest, please enter your PIN number. Once you do that, it'll say, please state your guest name, give your guest name, and it'll still say, you know, if you want uh, authorization for today, press one, authorization for tomorrow, press two, or another date, press three, and then they'll guide you through the process for that. And as you well know, we have not replaced uh, any full-time equivalency for the main gate volunteers since we lost them. So this will help my troops out tremendously. If, if you all have spent 15 minutes up there and heard the phones nonstop ringing, that, that's all they do. Uh, so they've been missed, but we haven't brought them back. So this should help us do that. And again, it's not very, it's not bad if you guys, it'll be a transition. You know, I even hate calling the bank and talking to the automated system, but it, it representative, you know, representative. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but it shouldn't be that hard. You know, it's you state your name, press one, press two, or three, and then take it from there. It's, it's really not that bad. So, any questions, comments, or concerns? Um, any, any questions? Yeah, Jay, yeah Tim, that um, robbery on Low Country Lane was that related to or have anything to do with that incident from a couple of weeks ago where the people were missing all those items? on Low Country Lane. Remember, they found their cell phone in the backyard. That was Low Country as That well. was Low Country. That was the same It's the same robbery. incident you're talking about? Yes. Okay, so it wasn't actually a, a confrontation, right? It was, a, I mean, robbery. It depends if, on If you were the resident, it was a confrontation. Yeah. I mean, but there wasn't a, an actual person. It, they just came home to find the stuff. No, no, the person was home. They were home when it happened. Yes. Okay. And, they, right. and they knew that they had a safe. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think it was the same one. For some reason, I thought the other one was something they just found things missing. 
<clears throat> no. Okay, so that that's the same incident. Yeah, it's kind of scary. Um, so let's leave you up there to do the repair. Can you X out a share though up there? While he's doing that, were there any other questions about the security report? I just had a quick question. As long as, or maybe this is even for Lynn. Um, how often do we do a do's and don'ts on golf cart cons to the community to go over? Because you know it's amazing. I passed out a couple on a golf cart when I was on mine. She's holding a little baby in her arms on the front seat, driving the golf cart. And I'm like, oh, I'm really We've done some golf cart safety articles in the past. They're not do's and don'ts lately. Do's and that's a good, fresh way of looking at it. I mean, it. that's yeah, a kind of a different way to look at it, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I don't just. Like, you know, X them out if you're on your phone or holding somebody or whatever. Yeah, I like Obviously, that. the phone thing is. Yeah. yeah. We yeah, say we, it, but maybe we can get some hey, pictures and some of that. I had an adult yeah. friend killed on the golf cart when her husband had to turn too quickly and she got thrown out. Well, and Tim referenced that in his last one and from Florida, and he's mentioning it again because Pete, some people thought he was here. He's like, you kind of missed the point. It can happen anywhere. So, Well, that's why I didn't clarify. Because <laughs> <laughs> they say, oh, I didn't have it here, and they just shut down. They're like, oh, that will never happen. Yeah, and it can. It can. And it has. Yes. But they wanted to focus on, did it happen here? Thank you, Mr. Wood. Yeah. I have it down. Thank yeah, yeah, I just thought. <laughs> okay. Let's do the repeater while you're out. Okay. Thank you. On page 32, you will uh, notice the recommendation for replacing the Motorola digital repeater. Uh, that's the uh, repeater that's essential for my troops to communicate their two-way radios. Um, it was scheduled to be replaced in 2023 at a cost of $16,000. Um, we got one bid in for um, 22,284. So with the 10% contingency that um, raises it to 23,913. Uh, Mobile Communications America was previously known as Savannah Communication is the authorized motor, motor uh, roller dealership in the area. So that's why we're going with them. As well as when, when our repeater failed in March, we called two companies and they were Johnny on the spot. They came out here. They diagnosed the problem as the power supply failure. Um, you know, again, with my troops have to communicate. So right away they got on board. They uh, got us a loaner unit out here. They charged us for one month since March and they haven't charged us since um, and, and got us up and running right away. So my recommendation is going to be to go with them for the replacement of digital repeal. So why is there the difference between $16,000? We originally, you know, quoted or quoted the uh, replacement for 2023 again for $16,000. Um, the additional funds on there were for funds that are going to go to Crown Castle associated costs. Um, they're the ones who leased the tower from us over by Public Works. So this proposal is going to be recommend take our digital repeater from the Marshwood Club maintenance facility. It's in the attic <coughs> over there. And you may want, want to know why was it placed over there in the attic? Well, again, when they came out here and they did a map survey of where would be a good place to place it, middle of the island, best coverage, that was it. Um, it is in a, a non-environmentally controlled attic, okay? And I think that's what led to its early demise. Um, one of the reasons, you know, heat and electricity or electrical equipment just don't go together. Um, so, I, you know, a couple years ago we were looking at it because I had to go up there and I had to put a battery back up there. I think I lost 32 pounds of water in about two minutes. <laughs> and, I, and I said, this is, it isn't working. So I talked to Sean and we, we said, hey, Public Works is probably the next, next best thing. Um, and the, the, the radio tower there, as you guys know, height is, is distance as well. So it's gonna get it up a little bit higher. So our coverage is gonna be about the same as what we got now. So we're not gonna lose anything. The gains are is that it's gonna be in our property and it's gonna be in an environmentally controlled area. So that's that $6,000 roughly Crown Castle. Although we own the towers, our contract says we got to go through them and get approval for anything added to that tower, which makes sense. Okay. So that's basically it. So recommendation uh, to replace the digital repeater, again, moving it forward uh, from 2023 to 2022 uh, for a total cost, of, including a 10% contingency of $23,913. So at this point, I'm looking for a motion to approve purchasing the digital repeater replacement at a total project cost of $23,913. We have a motion. Second? Second. Okay. Any questions or discussion? None? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Show me got the dumb tickets. <laughs> yes. All right. All right, if everyone will turn to page 30 in their packets, they'll see a staff report uh, with a recommendation. Uh, we are recommending, staff recommending a increase to the fee associated with the dump uh, fee schedule uh, with South Coast Logging. They're the company that does all the cellulose recycling um, at the maintenance facility three located off McWhorter Drive. Uh, we were contacted um, by the staff and the owners of South Coast Logging. One of the biggest challenges they're running into right now are the increases in staffing and uh, pricing and then also diesel is a major um, uh, commodity that they are using for their operations. They asked for a uh, really a relook at the fee structure to be able to offset some of those additional expenses they're seeing with their process. Uh, we went through the process of evaluating and doing an increase. Each ticket essentially is worth $25. So we kept it within that realm of $25. Uh, we did add in an additional um, category. So we don't have the luxury of having a scale to be able to weigh vehicles in and out and then get a you know per pound price, if you will. So we base it off of the number of wheels and axles essentially gets you closer to a, a weight as far as how much weight can be carried within those vehicles. I will say our contractors have gotten very creative on how they, uh, the equipment they use so they can carry more uh, debris in tandem axle trailers that have four tires or six tires versus the standard two. And so, um, and anyone that's doing tree work, grass mat or tree master just received a what looks like a disaster recovery truck that they're now picking up materials with. I just saw an island today. Um, but so we're trying to address some of that uh, with a new category, which is really the outlines by based off of number of axles plus number of tires, which helps get additional weight capacities. So those have been captured to help offset some of those. Uh, for the most part, most of the fee increases are going to be in the 20 to 35% range. And we have one category that didn't change at all, which is our smaller category, kind of that pickup truck size. Uh, it was reviewed by the Public Works Committee and Finance Committee, uh, which they did approve the recommendation. Therefore, we'll be looking for board approval uh, to increase the fee structure with South Coast Logging starting July 1st um, through the end of the year, uh, which we'll, we'll reevaluate at that point. Okay. So at this time, we're looking for a motion approving the increased fee structure for the maintenance and operation of TLA's Maintenance Facility 3 Chipping Yard for July 1, 2020 through December 2023. I have a motion. So moved. A second? Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion or questions? I have one. Okay. Yes. Yes. Just, I, I, I'm not all that familiar with this chipping. I, I see the yard and stuff like sure. that. But uh, so from what I read, it, it seems that the contractors pay the association the ticket and then we give the company coastal or um, ninety percent of that. That is and correct. We keep ten percent. Correct. Gotcha. And so the basis for that is uh, a little bit of history. Is that the facility was originally created and originally permitted as a burn facility, uh, and it was to really offset a lot of the development costs associated with Skidaway Island. It was changed in the early late mid to late nineties into a cellulose chipping facility where they actually chip the material and they're able to reuse it. They can either send it for boiler fuel or it can go to the mills. Um, in some cases it gets shipped overseas. Um, and so essentially taking what was a waste and being able to generate revenue on the backside, which also helped offset some of the cost here. Uh, Chatham County had a concern um, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s with uh, the facility and how it was operating. Um, independently, so that's why it's maintenance facility three, which then fits into our zoning. And then the other item is that we try to make, regulate all the material that's generated on Skidaway Island can only be accepted at that facility. So therefore, people, the contractors have to come in to the facility, they have to have material, they have to be able to buy the tickets directly from us. We manage the program, kind of the in and out, if you will. And then also the contractor on the backside is looking for the tickets to know that they've been purchased here from the landings. And then also they're looking to see uh, our banding on mm -hmm. a lot of the trees. Yard debris, it's, it's a little bit more difficult because we do get a lot of questions of people saying, well, I see trucks all the time coming in and off the island. Um, you know, back in uh, quite a few years ago, there were smaller trailers and, and, and trucks. They would go immediately and dump. A lot of contractors now kind of let everything pile up. They go get it all at once and then they kind of run around 
So it made it a little bit harder to manage that, but the best we can do right now is, is that structure that you described along with the, the banding that we do with the trees. I was, was confused that I knew we were signing checks to South Coast and I knew <laughs> yeah. we were getting revenue and I'm like, what is this? And the key is that 10%. So we're always checking kind of the, the revenue versus expense and we're, we're usually within 8% to 12% depending on how many people are buying tickets versus how quickly they're being re returned back. Thank you. Okay. I had the same question. Okay. okay. So on here it says Sorry. all material dumped is to originate from within the landings, but you just said it was from Skidaway Island. So somebody from off, I mean, still on Skidaway, but not the landings. So they, the, the counties use it as Skidaway Island. We view it really as land, or we view it kind of as Skidaway Island and the landings themselves, but they have to be able to get into the gates be pre-authorized, be doing the work on here to be able to purchase the tickets, and then also they'll have the banding on the trees on the backside to be able to check it when they come through. So it's not a perfect process, but it's uh, much, much improved from what it's been in But past. somebody like people at South Harbor can or cannot have trees removed and stuff? If they're using contractors that are also contractors of the landings, uh, they'll have the availability to be able to, to use the facility. But they're still buying tickets. I mean, they're still buying the tickets. We're not letting people come over the bridge and bring. No, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And they, I will say, it's interesting because one facility has already been closed down uh, off of 204. Now the next closest facility, the county closed the facility in on Wilmington Island. The next closest facility is to well out past 95, and so there's probably two to three trucks a day that get turned around that are trying to go into that facility and, and dump. Um, and the other issue that the contractor uh, South Coast is running into is that there's a lot more material that you would think with kind of the way the economy is going and, and you would start to see a kind of a decline, but the, what they're actually seeing is an increase in the amount of material that's coming in. And the other challenge I have on the backside is a lot of the paper mills um, aren't using as much of the material and they took, oh, they are accepting from anyone versus before everything was on quota. So they were guaranteed so many trucks per, per uh, month and all that's kind of gone away. So um, they got quite a few uh, challenges uh, within the operations to address. And this stuff is, was just working too smoothly. Right, right. Look for a way to upgrade this. That's system. right. So uh, in, in the past, have they run into problems that there was a recession? Like I, I could see the paper industry dropping and not wanting the, the material, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Have you seen that in the past though? A little bit, um, but not, not really to this extent. Um, it's been luckily we had paper or toilet paper shortages that really kind of drove the market there for a little while. So, um, but no, a lot of it's used for boilers now, and it's a very inexpensive way to run a lot of boiler systems uh, from a fuel standpoint versus natural gas or or petroleum based uh, options. So a little bit better for the environment. A little, a little. <laughs> right. Okay. If there were no more questions or comments about this. We have a motion and a second. All in favor. Uh, y'all what I was doing. Say aye. Say aye. <laughs> say aye. <laughs> okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> if you don't know what you're opposed to, <laughs> you can join me. Yeah. All right. HVC. Yeah. HVC. All right. Page 35 and 36 of your staff or in your uh, package, you'll see the staff and capital report for this. We did have um, one AC unit at uh, Landings Harbor Ship Store that failed. Uh, we've had multiple service calls out um, by uh, Climate Tech to look at the, the unit. And essentially what we found is there's some holes in the coils. Some of the fins associated with the outside unit have deteriorated beyond the point of, of repair. We've been able to limp that unit along uh, for the last month. Um, Questionably, with you know pumping more gas into uh, as we're having small leaks and trying to catch those leaks as they kind of continue on. So this is an unbudgeted. It is scheduled to be replaced uh, next year. However, due to the failure uh, of the system, uh, we are recommending that we move forward with Climate Air Tech to replace it, the unit with a four-ton uh, 16 sear Brian HVAC unit. This would be an addendum to our existing contract uh, for the three units that um, this group approved last month. Um, and again, it would be with the Climate Air Tech who we're currently under contract with, and also the, they are also the current service provider for all of our HVACs. Uh, therefore, we are looking for a recommendation from the board uh, to approve the replacement of the air conditioning unit 
at the Lanning's Harbor Ship Store, so Larry, too, does not lose 35 pounds, as Tim has <laughs> <laughs> during his operations. So. Okay, so this time looking for a motion approving the contract with Climate Tech Air for removal and replacement of the Landings Harbor Ship Store Building HVAC Furnish Unit at a total project cost of $10,586, including $375 for painting. Yes. So moved. All right. Second. Okay, any questions or discussion? No, I know where we are now. So, <laughs> all, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, Sean. Board committee or special reports? Any uh, board members from their, your committees have anything to add that wasn't already covered? No? All right. Director's comments. Any directors have a, just a general comment you want to make at this time? Uh, President's report. I have nothing to report other than what has already been discussed, so nothing to add. At this time, looking for a motion to adjourn to executive session. We have some items to cover there. <laughs> motion and a, a second. Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned.